Uh, hi again, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you who um, commented or messaged me privately about what they would want to hear about um, from me on this channel. So I, I really appreciate all the suggestions and I really do hope that I'll be able to get to all of them uh, at some point. Um, one sort of common thread that I seem to have found um, running through them is that people seem to really want to know how to like, um, for lack of a better word, uh, realize sort of fancy continuo parts. Um, you know, how do we how do we turn, you know, something that sounds like, you know, in, into into maybe like a figuration prelude, you know. Or something like that. Um, and uh, I really think it would be pretty much impossible to get from zero to a hundred in one video, and I also think it would be impossible to cover all levels of skill in getting from not knowing how to read a figured bass to creating a figuration prelude, by which I mean something with sort of a running rhythm over a bass that you're given. Um, but I would like to do my best to give a summary and kind of touch on the beginning and the end, and uh, I will fill in the gaps um, in due time. So, uh, I thought I would start by introducing uh, those of you who are maybe a little bit green to Continuo, um, the way that I learned um, with my first teacher, Ed Parmentier. So, those of you who studied with him or, or know about this will either, you know, feel nostalgic or get PTSD from what I'm about to show you, which is called harmony boxing. And this is, I think, a great way for beginners to learn how to just sort of get their feet wet with figured bass and develop some good finger habits. So let's dive into it. So what exactly is harmony boxing? I have in front of me um, a Corelli Violin Sonata. This is Opus 5, number one in D major. This is, it has a particularly easy continual part. And so harmony boxing will be particularly clear and simple for this one, which is why I chose it. So how does one harmony box a figured bass? Well, essentially one just draws a box around the harmonies. And when they change, you draw a new box. So for example, this part of the measure here is just D major, so I just label it with a capital D. This part of the measure here is A major, okay, and I know that because the violin is etching out an A major chord, and it's doing the same thing with D major over here, but if I didn't have the violin part, theoretically I'd know it from the figures, but we really shouldn't always trust the figures. Um, as you can see immediately by this missing six on the A. And in fact, I also see that this six is wrong and it probably should be there. So lesson here is that whether you're really, really great at continuo and have been doing this your whole life or you're brand new to it, you really should be spending some time with the score before you sit down and play it. So I'm just going to keep going here. Both of these chords in the next measure, the, the first and second beat, are different. This is B7 and this is E7. And this is A again. So you'll notice that I'm actually using, well, I'm, I'm using straight up jazz notation for this. Uh, and some of you might think that's total blasphemy, but um, you know, I, I just want to remind you that my job here is, is not to teach these things exactly how it was taught back then, uh, at least not um, you know, in a doctrinarian fashion, but rather to get people to understand this as well as possible and have a good time with it and get going as quickly as possible. So to that effect, I have no problem co-opting, um, you know, more modern symbols or, um, you know, or ideas if I think that it's going to uh, help us out. I'm not sure why it just zoomed in like that, but I guess we can still see everything, so no harm done. All right, so this one got changed to F-sharp minor, so this one is just A. All right, so you'll notice also a couple other things. Um, you'll notice that even though this is A major and this is A major, the bass notes are different. So I haven't labeled these, you know, differently. I, I haven't written this as A6, for example. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is just for simplicity. I only really care about what the right hand is, is doing um, and what chord it should be playing. So, you know, either way, that's A major, and I understand that that's a very ahistorical way to think about it, but... Um, but it's going to help us out later, as we shall see. So I'm just going to do a bit more. Um, we're not encountering any of these here, but when we get to minor, just a quick refresher, 
uh, this is a symbol for diminished, right? So if I write b diminished, that just means b d f. Um, if I put a slash through it, that means half diminished. So that would be, for example, this would be b d f a. Uh, and for diminished sevens, which is just a, a chunk of uh, minor thirds, so like b d f a flat, I actually just put an x. Um, put an x because that's what my teacher did, and also because you know diminished seven chords don't really have a root; they have four roots, so it doesn't technically make sense, I guess, to to give it a root. But you'll of course play the bass note under it that's written if you have such a thing. Uh, and here actually we have our first diminished chord. This is technically D sharp diminished. There's technically no B in this chord. Um, and in this case, actually, you probably shouldn't put one, although in a lot of cases, there's really not a problem with six chord three in the place of, of six um, sharp, if you're careful about how you play it. All right, I'm just gonna do a few more since I'm pretty sure everybody gets the idea. Uh, what is this? This is just C sharp seven. So notice this is not D and then D again also. And that's because the way that this is actually played and done in practice is that you're reading essentially two things. Your right hand is just reading the boxes. And your right hand is just going to plunk down D major and then stay there until the next time that you have a new box, basically. So for example, the first measure would basically just have two chords in your right hand, um, two half note chords, the first one being D major and the next one being A major. And you don't need to do anything fancy, you're just gonna hold that down and leave it there until you have the next chord. So let's take a look at how this will actually sound. So pretty simple and effective, right? Nothing fancy. So I'm sure you might have some questions at this point. Let me see how many of them I can anticipate and, and answer before, um, before you need to ask. So the first thing is maybe, well, Nicola, what about chords that don't fit into this neat little catalog of symbols that you have? Or what if I don't, when I'm unfamiliar with this notation that you're using? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I didn't really say before is that this is probably only going to work if these chords are easy for you to read and you can quickly find, for example, a major or, or you know, a major first inversion on a piano or a harpsichord. Um, and if you can't, then I, I would probably spend some time with the repertoire first before diving into this uh, continuum stuff. Um, for the rest of us, uh, I really think you pretty much have everything you need with uppercase, lowercase, sevens, diminished, half diminished, and fully diminished seven. There is some ambiguity with the type of seven chord. So for example, if I see this, I think like C dominant seven. So I think, you know, this chord. Um, some of you might like to write that like this, and that way um, C seven can just be the same thing, but without that guy. Or you might want to choose to write this like that, C major 7. Um, for minor chords, for this guy, right, I take that to mean C minor with a B flat on top of it. So if you need this chord, well, you wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that chord appear in Baroque music. Um, you see, you see this one quite a bit, especially in French music. Uh, 
um, but not so much, uh, not so much this one. Um, so in the situation that you do have a chord that doesn't really have a name, and it does happen once in a while, uh, actually just today I was playing some Purcell, and um, it happens extremely frequency, uh, frequently in Purcell. Um, uh, and it's a good thing because his, his inner parts are, are so fascinating. Uh, you get all of these, these motions that you, you don't normally get and, and it creates all of these interesting harmonies. Um, and in these situations, I will probably just not write anything. Um, the figure itself will be strange enough and unfamiliar enough that it will look like its own sort of symbol. And it'll look a bit like an address book sometimes when you're playing Bach or Purcell. And that's just the way it goes. Um, in extreme situations, I mean, for example, t uh, actually just today, I had, I, I saw this chord. Um, there's a bass clef. That's an E flat. So it's really just E flat major with a D major chord over it. And I only had, of course, I only had this much. So what I actually ended up writing was. Uh, So I just did this. So, all right, so the next thing is maybe, how can I actually practice with this and where can I go from here? Well, what should probably be said is that, you know, these are sort of trading wheels which are taken off at a certain point. So I wouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be preparing harmony boxes before every recital if you find yourself playing a lot of continuo. Um, this is really, uh, I think, something you should maybe do for a year or, or two if you really need it. Um, and then just kind of take them away. And, and you might feel nervous about doing that at first, but you'll find that actually you, you probably don't even need figures, let alone harmony boxes, after you've played enough of this. So what's a good sort of practice regimen and, and, um, and where, where can you go from here? So I would say probably a good idea is maybe one sort of five to ten minute piece or pieces um, per week. So, you know, something like a multi-movement work, like a Corelli Sonata, or like a Handel um, Cantata, his early solo ones. And, and these are actually particularly good because um, they, uh, they have a blank middle line, the most common edition, so you can write in things that you might need to write in. Um, and so you can harmony box it and then actually prepare it uh, and, and then play it for your teacher at the end of the week or record it or so you can mark your progress some sort of milestone and be doing this on a consistent basis um, every week sort of five to ten minutes of, of music as it would be performed in real time. Um, so the next thing we can worry about after this probably is voice leading, right? Um, which I actually wouldn't worry about at first. Um, and I would just kind of play the chords. Uh, actually, in continual playing, you know, you're you're going to end up playing parallels all the time. Sometimes out of necessity, and in fact, sometimes even people like Corelli, there's no way to to realize his figures without creating parallels in some instances. And so you have to cheat, and, and so you, you ignore certain figures or you roll things a certain way. Um, continuo is a lot of smoke and mirrors, um, but it's good to worry about this sort of while you're still playing blocked chords because it's a lot more clear. Um, if you do have to have parallels, which again, um, you shouldn't no parallel fifths or octaves, um, but you probably will. Uh, and if you do, then I would make sure that you put them in the middle voice, never in the outer voices, even when you, know, you kind of have to. Um, the next thing I, I might worry about after that is sort of hand position, and I would try the same, the same piece that you've harmony boxed in a, and, and try maybe a section of it in one hand position um, and another, and, and try to move your hands as little as possible when you're realizing your harmony boxes. And you should do this all the time, really, um, not just when you're practicing hand position. Um, after that, um, if you were, for example, working with me on this, I would probably worry about rolling and bring in some people to play with you. And rolling chords uh, in continuo, somebody could probably write a book about. It's actually, I think, probably an enormous topic. Um, and it, uh, it, it has a lot of power 
depending on how they're placed and how they're done and how quickly they're done and how sloppy they sound or how beautiful they sound. Uh, I think it's pretty good for harpsichord technique and definitely important for ensemble playing, but probably not so pressing an issue for people who are who are learning figure bass as a springboard for um, for keyboard improvisation, which I think is mostly new. So the next thing that would probably happen is then passing tones and other quote unquote uh, horizontal decorations. Which will be the subject of my next video. So I hope you enjoyed my super quick introduction into harmony boxing and I hope it'll allow some of you who are newer to Continuo to be able to just kind of sit down and, and play for a while um, after you've put the work in beforehand and hopefully you'll develop some good hand positions in the process and um, you'll have a little bit more more fun playing Continuo since you won't be bubbling about so much one hopes. So next week I hope to create a video about uh, figuration preludes, meaning some running notes that take care of the harmony in your right hand while your left just takes care of business on the page. And I think this will be a good window into the much more general topic of decorating figured bases and all of the different situations that this may or may not apply um, and uh, how this can be transported to, uh, you know, good technique in improvisation and, and partimento. So I hope you'll join me for that, and um, in the weeks that uh, that follow next week, I'll hopefully try to fill in some gaps over time about Basso Continuo. Not that, not that this will be a series entirely about Basso Continuo, but um, it's a very important topic that we could probably talk forever about. So um, got my work cut out for me already. All right, thanks everyone. See you next week.